Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to a new edition of our show titled Speak of Africa. Brothers and sisters, we are happy to bring you a new show. We have a whole lot of stories. But before we begin, we want to thank all our viewers. We want to thank all our subscribers, especially our contributors. We cannot thank you enough. Every week, you send us a lot of videos, pictures, and stories based on what you send to us. We decide on the theme for the show. We have a whole lot of information that we want to share, but we want to put this in perspective. Today is uh, the 4th of July in the United States. It's a day of uh, commemoration of American freedom. When we look at this, we look at what is happening in the motherland, Africa. The African youth are also fighting for their own freedom because just like the blacks in America feel like 4th of July doesn't really matter to them because they did not recognize them as human beings. They were still slaves when America became independent, but they felt black people do not have any independence. Similarly, Africans have not really received any independence. They still look upon themselves as slaves. So the youth of today, the African youth, is fighting now for African independence. And that's basically the story of today. Our people are really tired. We're facing a lot of bad governance. And the stories we're going to share today will really highlight this theme very, very well. We're going to start with uh, Ambazonia and uh, La Republic du Cameroon. Then we're going to shed light on Botswana. We've mentioned Botswana many times on this show as the oasis of democracy. You have Sir Serese Kama, who was the first president of Botswana. He set the tone of good governance. When I look at Serese Kama, it reminds me of people like George Washington, Thomas Jefferson in the United States. These were patriotic citizens. They were nationalistic. They loved their country, and they wanted their countries to do well. So those are the type of people we need in Africa as leaders. Unfortunately, we can't find these people. They are really a rare breed. You cannot find them. People like Serese Kama cannot really be found in Africa. Because when you look at the quality of leaders today, none of them matches Serese Kama. They are not patriotic. They are not aristocratic. They are little guys who cannot really aspire to greatness. They don't really believe in the vision of a greater Africa. So those are the type of people who are ruling Africa today. As a result, there's a whole lot of trouble. You go to Burkina Faso, there's trouble. You go to Ethiopia, there's trouble. You go to Kenya, Nigeria, there's trouble. You go to Mali, there's trouble. You go to South Africa, there's trouble. So we have a very, very great show for you today, and we're going to highlight all these stories. We're going to start with Ambazonia. We've talked a lot about Ambazonia in the past, so this week we're not going to talk a whole lot about Ambazonia. We just want to let you know that the war goes on. The war is still on. And today we have a, a video some of us, uh, you sent to us. It shows how police from La Republic du Cameroon shot an innocent person in cold blood in front of his friends and family. So you will see images of this. The people were very, very angry. They decided to break a police checkpoint in anger. So you can even take a look at this video. I died, this is a man when a quarter man, quarter man for below Foncha here. We don't come out, they come for inside a moto. Military people then shoot them, we don't get no motive. For inside your own quarter, you don't get no motive. Inside your own quarter, military people then shoot them. This Sunday, during a Sunday 4th of July, the whole, they shoot this so kill them. I will use them, you them for below Foncha, don't come out. Say military can't talk while we're the key. Man, where they they see every day, where they see every day, they know he. So it just tells you that the war goes on. War is not good. We, we think eventually La Republic will have no choice but to come to the table and negotiate because these atrocities are not going to go uh, down kindly because the people are already sick and tired of all of this and the Ambazonians are really fired up and they don't want to 
take no for an answer. Right now, they are not even thinking that federation is an option for them anymore. Total independence. That's what they are really looking for. And it looks like uh, the signs are there that uh, they're going to have their total independence. Then what about La Republique? Uh, not really much really happening in La Republique that is really positive. Well, on a comic note, Spike Lee, <laughs> the American uh, filmmaker, traced his roots to La Republique du Cameroon. And you can see a video where he's uh, dancing so Makosa. This is uh, a song popularized during the 1970s by Manu Dibango. Take a look at it. It's funny that uh, Spike Lee is uh, tracing his roots to La Republic of Cameroon. He doesn't even know this country, but I think as a critic and filmmaker, he's going to discover Cameroon. And very soon, I think he'll make a very good movie about Cameroon. And the Cameroonians probably think that uh, he has a lot of money and they may use his money and run their politics with it. But they are making a mistake. Spike is a very savvy business person. He will not give them any money and uh, they will regret getting close to him. He's going to really embarrass them a whole lot because he talks a lot and he's a very good critic. So don't mind if they want to get close to Spike Lee. He will make a movie out of uh, their calamity. So that's just what makes us really laugh because he, he sees what is happening there. And you can see a lot of the Francophones too. They are not really happy with uh, what is happening. You see most of them protesting in Europe and they are really carrying the flags of uh, the Amazonia. So it looks like they too are really tired of being French slaves. So we told you this before that the Amazonians are going to wake up the giants in La Republique du Cameroon. They're going to start saying that they cannot remain French slaves. We have some documents which we're going to share with you uh, this week. You will see these documents really tell you the way the French force the Cameroonian uh, stooges of leaders to gain their independence, which was like a fake independence. You see the contracts, they signed colonial contracts, because uh, the, the pacts, colonial pacts, as a condition for independence. You can see some of the documents we shared with you so you can really see them live. And that's why the La Republic of Cameroon has no freedom. And that's why when you go to French Cameroon, there's no freedom. But one good thing which uh, happened and which we must commend La Republic of Cameroon for, it's uh, digital passports. One of the toughest things in that part of the world has always been trying to get a passport. It's like finding a haystack, looking for a needle in a haystack. It's very, very tough. And I will tell you that it's very, very tough. Finally, now they have made it possible for you to get your passport in 48 hours. So that's a good sign. And we really praise them for that. But how is this working? We tested the site. And it looks like the site has a lot of box. It was not really working well because we wanted to see how easy it is to uh, apply for a passport online. We have pictures of uh, the buildings in La Republic, which you can see a uh, nice structures in a 2D, which show you how you can get your passport. But when we try to, the box did not let us go through. So the whole system failed. So we don't know how it's working practically in Yaoundé. So. That's just what we can tell you about La Republic. But you can see a whole lot of uh, pictures. Everything is really sad. The people are really protesting too. And we we'll move now to Burkina Faso. Burkina Faso too has a whole lot of uh, stories. This week, what we saw was uh, the president fired his uh, defense chief because of failure to stop the killing of uh, the citizens by jihadists. We told you that part of the Sahel, even with a French presence with the Bahan op operation, they are still killing a lot of innocent people. And there was a few months ago, we told you when they killed over 130 people in Burkina Faso. And where was the security? The security is not there. And that's the sad thing about Africa. It's lawless. People ask ourselves, why is it that they are killing people? Where is the security? The security officers are not there. So they killed these people in cold blood, and more people have been killed. So the Secretary of Defense was forced to resign. So he has resigned. Hey, yo, Shay, I thought you was going to take me to this place so I could get my taxes done. You know I'm trying to buy a new house. What's up? Listen.
let's get it on. If you're searching for a house, call up my man Prince O'Jone, the best in real estate. Take it from your guy's shape when I say his services are the best in the state. Toward his born, he even take care of your tax forms, fat refunds. So come, get your business done. Consultations, financial organization, fast processing. No way, and this man is amazing. The Prince. Act now and call Prince Ojong at 240-350-1131. That's 240-350-1131. Next, we'll move to Ethiopia. A few months ago, we talked to you about Ethiopia, and we told you that uh, Abiy Ahmed, who has been a Nobel Prize winner, decided to declare war on the Tigray region. We told you that this was a mistake, and we predicted that the Tigray are very powerful fighters, so they're going to force Abiy Ahmed to withdraw. A few days ago, whatever we predicted happened. <laughs> okay, you can see because the Tigray region, who are battle-hardened fighters, forced the government of uh, Abiy Ahmed to make a ceasefire, declare a ceasefire, and move out of Mekele, the capital of the Tigray region. So you can see over 7,000 soldiers of uh, Abiy Ahmed were arrested by the Tigray uh, region uh, army, and they were held in a big, you can see big vehicles with a lot of soldiers, some of them were walking on foot. So what a defeat, what a shame. We've always said it's better to negotiate problems, but most of these African leaders, they love to use force. They don't believe in negotiation. And look at the humiliation Abiy Ahmed faced this week. So that's his uh, shame. Next, we'll move to Kenya. Kenya has an interesting story because Kenya is acting as a pro proxy in a, a story that was hard the whole of this week in Nigeria. As you guys know, Nigeria is a very big uh, country in Africa. You've known of uh, IBOP, which is uh, a group which is trying to secede the indigenous uh, people of Biafra, which is led by Manzi Namdi Kanu. Just like in a play, Namdi Kanu was arrested in Kenya and extradited to Nigeria. People could not believe it when they saw him in a court in Abuja facing trial. How did this happen? So after so many conjectures, Kanu is a British citizen and he's also a Nigerian citizen. So people could not really believe that Britain would extradite him to Nigeria to go and face any charges. So it turns out that Ansari Dokubo, a politician who has had some beef to pick with uh, Mr. Kanu, made some played some games and invited him to Kenya so they can meet and talk peace. Little did Kanu know that this was a ploy. He was arrested by Kenyan security and he was molested. Then after that, he was uh, handed over to the Nigerian security uh, apparatus. Then he was taken to Nigeria. But when we were researching this story, initially the Kenyan uh, government said, well, they had nothing to do with it. They didn't know anything about it. Maybe Kanu happened to be across their border. So they just denied the, the whole thing. So it makes us think that how lawless can Kenya be? We've been looking at Kenya as not a perfect democracy in Africa, but a model democracy. They've had their challenges, but they've always tried to make peace. We saw the way Odinga and uh, the president of Kenya tried to make peace as brothers. So we're thinking this kind of rapprochement tells us that these are people who are for new politics, the politics of engagement. But when they did this, we begin to see Kenya as a country of lawlessness. Because if you follow the rules, you cannot just hand somebody to another country without following the rules. You may talk about Interpol. What does the Interpol rule say? Because right now, there were so many conjectures. People were asking themselves, why did they pick this guy from the Jomo Kenyatta Airport in Kenya? Then. He was molested for like eight days, and this guy is a patient. They did not really care about his health. They just molested him. Already, this is going to make Kenya look bad to a lot of Nigerians. They will be seeing Kenya as a lawless nation. So don't be surprised when the prestige of Kenya goes down, because they feel Kenya is not really a country that is democratic. 
Mm -hmm. So Kenya has already lost a lot of points with the Namdi Kanu story. But the only thing we think, the Buhari government did something well. They tried to make the whole process legal. As we were taping the show of today, news reached out that uh, Namdi Kanu has been released uh, on bail. So he's out. And now we think he can take care of his health, so, which is good. But the story of today, we really want to focus on the movements, the nationalism in Nigeria, which is really responsible for a lot of the insecurity. For many weeks, you guys have been talking to us about uh, the Yoruba nation, the Yoruba nationalism. And we promise you we're going to come up with some stories. Initially, we were hesitant to talk about it because we wanted to gather in a lot of information. But we think we've gathered a lot of information. Our team has worked very hard to really understand what is really going on. So actually, there are remote causes and immediate causes to the Yoruba nationalism. What is really happening? You should have to understand that if you've studied uh, Nigerian history, the Yorubas were just like a nation before independence. When you look at the history of Nigeria, Yorubas are not just a culture. They even have a civilization. Uh, a civilization is like a very high form of culture. And I was really introduced to the Yoruba civilization when I started studying the works of uh, Wole Shoinka in the university. That's when I, I became really impressed with the depth of Yoruba culture and civilization. You will not really believe it as a foreign person. If you really want to get a clear idea of how deep you, the Yoruba civilization is, you need to study the works of uh, Wole Shoinka. Mm -hmm. So when you study like his plays, you really get a better understanding of the way this civilization operates. As a result, the Yorubas have always been proud of their ethnicity and their achievement. They are probably the most educated group in Nigeria, and they are proud of it. But it doesn't just lie there. They've always regretted the fact that they allowed themselves to become part of Nigeria, and they're not really reaping the benefits of independence. They felt that they had the power to resist the pressure from the colonial masters and emerge as a nation of their own. But the British colonialists forced them together in a sandwich nation called Nigeria, and they've been paying the price. So those are like some of uh, the remote causes. It's like they look back in nostalgia what they should, they should have been and what they cannot do by not being able to self-actualize. So this has really happened a whole lot. But there are also immediate causes to the Yoruba nationalism. And this has to do with the current insecurity that has been brought forth by the Buhari administration's weakness to control the insecurity happening in Nigeria today. Much of the insecurity that has been happening in Nigeria it traces its roots to Buhari's inability to handle the banditry of Awuzas and Fulani headsmen. Usually when you own land, and the Yorubas know this as a civilization, when you own land, you own what they call real property. When you own real property, you need to have what they call a bundle of rights. And the bundle of rights deals with disposition, enjoyment, exclusion, possession, and control. So these are all features that you have when you own property. But the northern headsmen are not allowing the Yorubas to exercise their bundle of rights, of legal rights, when they own their property. Because the Yorubas need to control their property, meaning that the northern headsmen cannot just come and encroach on this property as grazers, okay? So this doesn't bode well, and this has been causing a whole lot of friction. When the, the Yoruba guys try to complain to the uh, central government of Buhari, Buhari's government decided to do nothing about it. Instead, his inaction encouraged bandits such as Ahmed Gumi. IPOB, IPOB is attacking the police, is attacking the army, is attacking INEC, government institutions, killing our men in service. And the hacksmen are kidnapping children not to kill them, to get money. So how can you compare somebody who's killing our gallant men? 
and the armed forces directly attacking them to somebody who's kidnapping children to make money, not to kill them. Look, we, have to, we need some fairness in what we are doing. If you are a Yoruba person and you complain that they are trespassing on your land, Ahmed Gumi will send their thugs to come and kill your family or, or even beat you up. So that kind of lawlessness has really been going on. So initially, what happened, the Yorubas decided now to form what are called the Amotekun, which stands for like a leopard or just like a vigilante kind of group to try to handle the insecurity situation in their area of the country, which is the southwest. And one of the leaders, which you know already, is Ganiyu Adams. So he really spearheaded this uh, movement. And if you watch a lot of videos on YouTube, you come across the name Ganiyu Adams a whole lot. I've watched a lot of the videos. I've watched interviews of Ghani Adams. And I've seen the work that he's been doing to try to protect his people. So he's not happy when the northern uh, headsmen kill Yoruba people for their own spots. So he tries to protect his people. Similarly, you also have uh, another actor which story is more relevant today. You can see like what is happening today. And this is Sunday Idehu. He too has just been fighting this government because he is an activist. A few days ago, DSS, the, the Department of State Security of Nigeria, decided to attack his home and they killed uh, two people and he barely escaped death. Even as we tape this story, the whereabout of uh, Sunday Igo is not even well known. But some of the people have told us that uh, the, the Nigerian government wants him to turn himself in, but he has responded that uh, they should give him time. So we'll let you know by next week what is really going to happen to this story. But it's a developing story. But this gives you a background to the whole idea of Odudua, Odudua Republic, the Yoruba nationalism. So we've given you the remote cause and the immediate cause. Then you also have other actors like Miete Allah. But it seems as if Mr. Buhari doesn't want to do anything to the Miete Allah. Why not? If Mr. Buhari will spend time to send people to arrest Namdi Kanu many, many miles away, why can he not deal with the people of the Miate Allah? So that's a question our people want to know. So this is what has really given rise to the whole nationalism among the Yorubas, where they feel that the Nigerian government is not protecting their interests, is not protecting their people, so they have to take the law into their own hands. So this is what has really been fueling the Yoruba nationalism, and people have been asking us what is going on. We've said we're going to share this with you so that you can really make sense out of it, because when the government cannot really give you security, then you have to look for ways to provide security for yourself. So why is Buhari not doing anything to Ahmed Gumi? What about Miyate Allah? What about Boko Haram? Of course, we've talked about Boko Haram so many times on this show. Buhari has not been able to do anything with uh, Boko Haram. So it's really sad. Nothing is really happening. And you know, a lot of the Boko Haram guys are just in the Sambisa forest. But Buhari doesn't know what to do with them. He just keeps quiet. So it looks like his inaction is really fueling a lot of resentment among other Nigerians. So things have gotten to a point where most of the other communities, they feel like Nigeria should be split. Let the northern guys have their own country, let the Yorubas have their own country, and let the Igbos have their own country. So there's so much tension and strife, even as we tape the show of today. A young girl was killed during a protest in Lagos. Initially, Sunday Igo was planning to go to Lagos to protest, but since the security forces are trying to kill him, he took a break, but a lot of his followers decided that they had to storm Lagos and protest in Lagos. Of course, they are unhappy also because Bola Tinubu is not making any noise about the protests. They feel like he wants to be president in 2023. As a result, he's selling off the Yoruba short to the northerners. So the Yorubas are not really happy with Bola Tinubu because of his inaction. He's trying to keep quiet, telling them, listen, wait until I get to the, the chair. When I'm president, I'll know what to do. But a lot of Yorubas are dying, and people like Sunday Igo and Ganiyu Adams cannot sit and wait and watch the people die in cold blood every day. So they think enough is enough, 
and they feel like T Bola Tinubu should do something about what is happening. But Bola Tinubu's presidential ambitions are keeping him quiet. He doesn't want to talk because he doesn't want to alienate the northerners. If he alienates the northerners, he will not have their support for 2023 presidential elections. So this is why he's keeping quiet. So you have to really understand the way the whole power game is played in Nigeria. It's very, very funny. Okay? So when you look at this, you ask yourself, how are things going to progress from here? Things are really going to really be tough in, in the next few weeks because Obasanjo has even suggested that it looks like it would be a good idea for Mr. Buhari to look for a way to address a lot of this insecurity, but it looks like Mr. Buhari is over his head with problems. He doesn't really know what to do, which is why we've always said it takes a strong guy, a powerful guy, to lead a country like Nigeria. Mr. Buhari seems to be really weak. He doesn't really know what to do. It looks like he's beholden to a lot of those uh, militant groups in the north. He doesn't want to alienate them. So he doesn't want to do anything to make them angry. But you have to understand, by Nigerian law, when you own real property, you need to have your bundle of rights, which are normal rights in real property, in, even in English law, which even applies in the United States. The real estate law we have in the United States is derived from English law. When you have your property, you deserve to have control. You need to have a way to dispose of your property the way you want. A northern herdsman should not dictate how you use your property. If you tell him not to encroach on your property, he comes and kills your family. How can we live like this in a civilized society? And those are the problems that Nigeria is really having today. And we've decided that we have to draw your attention to them. Similarly, we think Mali too should not be forgotten. As we're coming, to tape the show of today, we got information that the French have made a U-turn. They want to come back to Mali. So why can they not leave? They said they were leaving and the people said, okay, leave. But now they are coming back. So you see that France is a parasite. They cannot do without Africa. So it looks like what is really going to happen in the end is they have to really push them out, finally. Okay, they have to push them out. And I even want Nigeria also to push France out. Okay, now, the northerners seem to accommodate the French a whole lot. And this is something that really irritates us who are Pan-Africanists. It's difficult to kick the French out because the Northerners tend to like the French. Okay? The French give them power and the British give them power, so they like to have these colonial masters around. Then there's one video which we're going to share with you on Nigeria before we leave. And this video deals with, uh, I'll call it an apology from one of the Northern elite. The guy was uh, making a case for the North. And when I listen to the guy speak on this video, I asked myself, everything this guy said in the video was just a bunch of lies. The North has nothing. The North is a desert. It has nothing to offer. So if Nigeria is divided into three parts, the, the North stays in the North, the South East, the Southwest, the other people will be happy in their regions because they have a lot. The North has just peanut. How much peanut can they sell? And this dude, in, in this video was saying that uh, the, the oil that was built and processed in the southeast was produced with money from the north. Where did the north get this money? From peanuts? Selling peanuts? This is a joke. And I really want you to watch this guy and listen to what he's saying. Then he was even making threats. And some of these threats are also attributable to the Yoruba guys. He's making threats telling the Yoruba guys that if you don't behave, we're, we're going to do something to you were called parasites. Today we are declaring that we, the northerners, are the economic heart of Nigeria. We are the economic heart of Nigeria. The oil that is so being busted on today was discovered, harnessed, and the refineries were constructed with the northern Nigerian sweat with the northern Nigerian economy, with the northern Nigerian money, the money of granite, pyramid, and cotton was the one that was used to re research, discover, and build the refineries that are some other part of Nigeria are claimed to be their own personal property. If that is the case, we also deserve, just like NNDC and Niger Delta Ministry, that should be a northern development ministry that should also be given the same amount of money that is giving, given to NNDC because our money was the money that was used to develop the oil. 
So when I look at these uh, threats, then I ask myself, maybe it is time we are Pan-Africanists, but maybe it is time for Nigeria to start thinking seriously about restructuring, how they can reorganize their country. If not, the youth of Nigeria will continue protesting every day. And you can see a lot of the videos. South Africa is an example which shows you how the rule of law is applying to a country. It's not perfect, but they are struggling to apply the rule of law. You will see that Jacob Zuma, former, the former president of the country, is ch charged with contempt of court. Okay? He had to play some tricks to delay the process, but you can see that the rule of law is applying in this country. We expect the same thing to happen in the other countries in Africa, Nigeria, for example. We need to see the rule of law applying. We think we've really focused a lot on a lot of stories, and those who really like us to talk more about what is happening in Nigeria and uh, Yoruba nationalism, Odudu, or Republic, we're going to gather more information. But so far, we've just given you some hints on what is happening, and we'll sh continue sharing developments. So now you can understand the whole story, what is really happening in Nigeria and other parts of Africa. Thank you very much for watching this show. And we're telling you to subscribe to our show and share the videos with your friends. Thank you very much. Is your EMR EHR COVID-19 ready? If not, you do not know what you are missing. Why do you suffer in silence? Be smart. Turn to Alexia HTC today. Alexia HTC is the leader in virtual solution and communication technology in these times of pandemic crisis. When the unexpected happens, who are you going to call? Alexia HTC. Come and see how Alexia HTC cloud communications are enabling your fellow healthcare providers to consult with patients virtually and making big money. Alexia HTC also enables your employees to work remotely during the COVID-19 crisis. Are your employees safe? Do not jeopardize the health and safety of your patients and practice. What can Alexia HTC do for you? Alexia HTC is the new Colossus, the sister of physicians who gives you back liberty, that is, the freedom to practice medicine your way. Vivacious virtual visits wherever you please. Amazing e-prescribing. Quick access to patient information. Easy access to medical records from other providers rapid drug allergy checks, integrated lab tests and results. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled doctors yearning to breathe free. The wretched refuse of your greedy corporations. Send these, the homeless, tempest toast physicians to me. I give them the refuge. The happy home of Alexia HTC. Act now. Browse AlexiaHTC.com or call 240-350-1131. Medical practice software is too old. Indeed, all the programs are built on mumps, technology of the 1950s, and the programs cost too much money. Epic and Cerner cost billions of dollars. Meditech costs thousands of dollars too. In fact, that's why we created AlexiaHTC.com, a new and free EMR slash EHR for doctors. AlexiaHTC.com is built for HIPAA. Yes, magical one-screen technology, ease of use, quick charting, amazing e-prescribing, tight labs integration, multi-office difference, because we believe doctors and patients need a break today. Be the first to test drive AlexiHTC.com. You have nothing to lose. You have everything to gain. Act now. Call 240-350-1131. Alexia Care Corporation at AlexiaHTC.com. Selling a service or a product? Need buyers? Use the African Nation TV as a channel to reach many viewers. Act now and call Prince Ojong at 240-350-1131. That's 240-350-1131. Act today.